Hi, I'm Joe Alden, MD of Survival Top 50's Reader's Choice website, two years running, doomandbloom.net, with over a thousand articles, podcasts, and videos on medical preparedness. Together with my wife, Amy Alden, an advanced registered nurse practitioner, we're the authors of the 2017 Book Excellence Award winner in medicine, The Survival Medicine Handbook, now in its 700-page third edition, and the designers of an entire line of medical kits at store.doomandbloom.net. Most of us have dutifully gone to get a tetanus shot when we stepped on a rusty nail, but few have any real concept of what tetanus is and why it is so dangerous. So what is tetanus? Tetanus comes from the Greek word tetanos, meaning tight, and it's an infection caused by the bacteria Clostridium tetani. The bacteria produces spores, which are inactive bacteria to be, let's say, that primarily live in the soil or the feces of animals. These spores are capable of living for years and are resistant to extremes in temperature. Tetanus is pretty rare in the United States, with about maybe 30 to 50 reported cases a year. Worldwide, however, there are more than 500,000 cases a year, mostly seen in developing countries in Africa and Asia that have poor immunization programs. Citizens of developed countries, however, can be thrown into third world status in the aftermath of a mega catastrophe. Therefore, we can expect many more cases that could be your responsibility as medic to evaluate and treat. So what causes tetanus? Most tetanus infections occur when a person experiences a break in the skin. The skin is the most important barrier to infection that you have, and any chink in that armor leaves a person open to infection. The most common cause is some kind of puncture wound, such as an insect or animal bite, a splinter, or maybe even that rusty nail. By the way, you can get it from a nail that's not rusty too. Puncture wounds are more common to transmit tetanus because the bacteria doesn't like oxygen, and deep, narrow wounds, like puncture wounds, give less access to it. Any injury that compromises the skin, however, is eligible. When a wound becomes contaminated with tetanus spores, the spores become activated as a full-fledged bacterium and they reproduce rapidly. Damage to the victim comes as a result of a strong toxin excreted by this organism known as tetanospasmin. This toxin specifically targets nerves that serve muscle tissue and binds to motor nerves, causing misfires that lead to involuntary contraction of the affected areas. Nerve damage could be localized or could infect the entire body. You would possibly see the classic symptom of locked jaw, where the jaw muscle becomes very tight. Uh, any muscle group, however, is susceptible to the contractions if they're affected by the toxin. And this includes even the respiratory musculature, which can inhibit normal breathing, and tetanus then becomes life-threatening. The most severe cases seem to occur at extremes of age, with newborns and those over 65 most likely to succumb to the disease. Death rates from general untreated tetanus hover around 25%, but much higher in newborns. You should be on the lookout for the following early symptoms. Sore muscles, especially near the site of injury, weakness, irritability, difficulty swallowing, lockjaw, also called trismus, facial muscles are often the first affected. Initial symptoms may not present themselves actually for one to two weeks after the actual injury. As the disease progresses, you might see things like progressively worsening muscle spasms, starting locally and becoming generalized over time, involuntary arching of the back, sometimes so strong that bones can break or dislocations may occur, fever, respiratory distress, high blood pressure, irregular heartbeats, my gosh, just about anything. The first thing that the survival medic should understand is that although an infectious disease Tetanus is not contagious. You can feel confident treating a tetanus victim safely as long as you wear gloves and observe standard clean technique. Begin by washing your hands and putting on your gloves, then wash the wound thoroughly with soap and water using an irrigation syringe and 3% hydrogen peroxide. Repeatedly flush this out until you got out all the debris. This hopefully will limit the growth of the bacteria there and as a result, decrease toxin production. You'll want to give antibiotics to kill off the rest of the tetanus bacteria in the system, however. Metronidazole, fish zole or flagyl, 500 milligrams four times a day or doxycycline, bird biotic, 100 milligrams twice a day for a week or two weeks are among some of the drugs known to be effective. Remember, 
The earlier you begin antibiotic therapy, the less toxin will be produced. IV hydration, if you have the ability to administer it, is also helpful. Keep the patient comfortable by putting them in an environment with dim lights and reduced noise. Late stage tetanus is difficult to treat without modern technology. Ventilators, tetanus antitoxin, muscle relaxants, sedatives such as Valium and Flexeril are used to treat severe cases, but they're going to be unlikely to be available to you in a long-term survival situation. For this reason, it's extraordinarily important for the survival medic to watch anyone who has sustained a wound very carefully. As medic, you have to maintain a detailed medical history from anyone you might be responsible for in times of trouble. And that includes immunization histories where possible. Most people in the U.S. will have gone through a series of immunizations against diphtheria, tetanus, and whooping cough early in their childhood. Most tetanus cases do seem to occur in people who haven't gotten the vaccine. Vaccines for tetanus, however, don't give lifelong protection. Booster injections are usually given every 10 years or if five years have passed in a person with a fresh wound. Tetanus vaccine is not without its risks. Severe complications such as seizures or brain damage occur in less than one in a million cases. Milder side effects, however, such as fatigue, fever, nausea and vomiting, headache, and inflammation at the injection site are much more common. The important thing is to know the symptoms and treat the infection as early as possible. If not caught early, there may be little you can do to treat your patient without all the bells and whistles of modern medicine. This is Joe Alton, MD, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you the best of health in good times or bad. Thanks for watching. Hey, if you need a solid medical kit for that wilderness hike, hunting trip, or even long-term survival, check out Nurse Amy's entire line at store.doomandbloom.net. That's store.doomandbloom.net. You'll be glad you did.